Washington Institute with a master's degree um, back when the program, I guess, was still called uh, Computational Applied Math. So now it's CSEM um, back in 2008. And since then, he's worked as a research scientist um, for the Department of Defense, started his own business, and then uh, sold that business and then joined ANSYS um, as um, and ANSYS, as you know, is a simulation engineering software um, that is a, a leader in the uh, industry. Without further ado, Anthony. Hey, thanks a lot. Appreciate it, guys. So um, great to be here. Great to be back in the Asian building, which is no longer the Asian building, I know. Hmm. So, um, so I'm going to talk through a few things here and basically try to give a perspective uh, on the industry behind the work that is done in this building that I didn't have a good perspective on when I was here and hope that that, hope that, that helps some of you get a little broader perspective on what's out there. So multi-billion dollar commercial market for physics-based simulation. Uh -oh. yeah. uh, I guess you have to point it out the laptop. Oh wait, hang on. We got a, we got a message here. That's what's going on. Should be okay. Stand by. Got it. Come back to here, click. There we go. All right, so I'll introduce myself, there I am. Uh, I was born and raised in Austin, Texas, the unicorn as some call it, although with a bunch of young people in the room, I'm probably not that much of a unicorn, but you get, you, know, you get people over 40 years old and not a lot of born and raised in Austin. I went to Westlake High School um, and uh, coming out of Westlake, all my friends were going to the University of Texas. I thought that was boring. I was gonna be different. <laughs> I went to the University of Michigan, actually, and I was there for one year, and I said, I don't want to be different anymore. And I came to, whoa, and I came to University of Texas at Austin. So uh, in 2006, graduated with a degree uh, in mechanical engineering. That was a great experience. Uh, while I was there, I got uh, hooked up with this guy named Dr. David Littlefield. Uh, nobody in this room probably knows him except Professor Roden and Professor Anxious. Uh, he was a good guy. He, as an undergraduate, I was uh, pulled on to his team to start doing uh, kind of graduate level research. It was a really cool opportunity. Um, and we were using what are called hydrocodes, hydrodynamic simulation codes, basically, um, you know, large Department of Energy codes for studying impact. And that was a really cool experience throughout undergraduate to be able to work on that and kind of get into the flow, be in this building. Be, be going into that work. Um, and it led to uh, coming out of uh, mechanical engineering, thinking I was gonna go get some job somewhere. I got recruited pretty heavily by, I think it was Raytheon. They really wanted me to move to Arizona and work on missiles. They really came after me hard. It was flattering, but I, I, I chose to stay uh, here and do, as you pointed out, what was at the time, the CAM program, Computational Applied Mathematics. I understand now the name, Computational Science Engineering and Mathematics. There you go. And that was a really good decision, a really good decision to stick around and do that. Um, I got to work with some amazing people. Uh, I worked with Dr. Roden himself a lot, which is great. I worked with Dr. Roden, he was my advisor. Um, and while here, worked actually for the Oden Institute as a graduate research assistant and for this group called IAT that was around called the Institute for Advanced Technology. It was a venture between the University of Texas and the U.S. Army uh, to do railgun research of all type of nature, which is really neat that we were doing that a long time ago and there were no railguns around and now there's some ships that have railguns on, which is kind of neat. So that was great. Um, it was all basically computational mechanics research doing uh, using, using simulation tools to mostly study hypervelocity impact. Uh, it was great, really, really good, but it was all very much based on um, kind of, you know, Department of Energy, Department of Defense developed tools, nothing commercial, all internal, no user interface to speak of. I still remember the first day I got taught how to use this code called CTH from San Diego National Labs, and uh, it was in this building by a guy named Paul Bauman, and I was blown away because there was no user interface. Imagine somebody being like, hey, you're going to use this software, and it's super advanced, and it's fantastic, and you gotta you know write a text file like input deck. I was like, what? That's that's how you do this. And anyway, so that's the beginning of a long story for me um, that we will go through. But that was great. That was kind of how it worked. But then I got this itch, and I thought, man, I you know, I uh, kind of wanted to 
be an entrepreneur and start a business. And there was this other student that was uh, here <clears throat> with me named Phil. He's a really good guy. And we went off and started a business together. Total non sequitur, nothing to do with anything in the technical realm. It was a healthy foods business. And um, we were at first distributing and then manufacturing healthy foods to schools. We actually at one point had uh, O's Cafe downstairs as a customer. And we were just distributing kind of Asian foods, rice bowls and things like that. And that was actually fantastic. Very, very good experience. Um, very good business was growing healthily, really had a great distributor, ended up buying the distributor out after a couple of years. Um, Bonsai is still in existence today. My buddy Phil still runs it. It'll probably revenue over $50 million this year. So serious business. But I got an itch to, to get out. I didn't really want to do that with my life. I kind of pictured Dr. Odin kind of looking at me and being like, you look pretty good at this stuff. Why are you leaving? I'm wondering what Dr. Odin is. <laughs> well, it's funny, Dr. Wilcox, I actually remember early on coming into this building with a platter of food to show O's Cafe and being terrified that he would see me and go, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so uh, after a few years of that, I gracefully exited that, sold my stake in the business to my buddy Phil, like I said, most of it anyway. Uh, he's still going strong. And I decided I wanted to get back into real work, technical work. So I went to the Department of Defense and became a research engineer, working on very similar things to before, worked on um, what's called insensitive munitions research. So um, whenever you've got anything that explodes, any kind of munitions, any kind of high explosives, uh, it needs to be safer. It's a major problem in the world that it goes off when it's not supposed to for various reasons. And that causes a lot of trouble. So the Department of Defense puts a lot of research dollars into making the munitions more insensitive, which means they only go off when they're supposed to, period. And so we did a lot of computational mechanics research around that. Um, multi-scale modeling type stuff, basically the way you make munitions more insensitive is you put more plastic in it and less explosive. And you gotta figure out the right way to do that and the right mixture, that was great. But working for the DOD wasn't really for me either because it was so slow. And it was really frustrating to work on projects for a really long time that then got canceled and went over and feel like, man, I just wasted a year of my life working on something that isn't ever gonna turn into anything. So I didn't really want to be an entrepreneur at this tiny company. I didn't really want to work for the biggest company. So I found Ansys, which was at the time, still is kind of basically a medium-sized company in the world. It's not nearly as large as the Department of Defense, but it's a healthy, thriving company as you'll hear. Um, and so joining Ansys uh, about 11 years ago was a really good move. It was perfect, perfect fit. And um, I guess, you know, I, at the time, I really didn't know much about it commercial simulation. I'm going to tell an embarrassing story now. It has to do with when I was in this period here, um, still an undergrad working in this building, probably 2004-ish, and I was starting to get familiar with computational mechanics and simulation tools in general. And I still remember that I went over uh, to my friend's apartment at West on West Campus, and we sat down, we were talking, we were you know, enterprising young folk, and I had this idea. And I said, you know, we use these simulation tools and I was really starting to get good at them and be able to do a wide variety of things. I thought, I think that you could use these tools to simulate things beyond, you know, hypervelocity meteorites and, and projectiles and things. You could use these tools to simulate everyday products. And companies could use this stuff to develop products better. And I don't know, we should start a company to do that. And I had just had the idea for a multi-billion dollar market that already existed that I knew nothing about. <laughs> Not my finest moment, but I was just naive. I had no idea. And so that's what ANSYS is, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, before I go on, I will say that my goal coming into this speech was actually to be very company neutral in this space and to talk about the market in general and not really major in ANSYS. Uh, I found that to be quite difficult considering I work for ANSYS, all the slide material and everything I have is ANSYS. So, uh, you know, there's definitely a bit of a bent there, but know that my intention is really to talk about the market overall, not just one of the participants in the market. But with that said, the best way that I know how to introduce the market overall is to introduce one company in it. Ansys happens to be the number one company, the leader. So I'm going to do that. What I want to do first is give you a, a impression of what kind of company Ansys is. 
um, to show you that out there, it's a serious company in the world. I'm sure many of you have heard. Actually, that's an interesting survey. How many people have heard of ANSYS before? I can promise you that in 2005 or six or whenever I was starting here, that that would not have been the case. Not that many people would have heard of it. So that's really encouraging. That's good. Um, but what you probably don't know about ANSYS, it's a pretty serious company out there. So we have some friends at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and they put together this slide that we really like showing because they, you know, they're constantly trying to get our business and do stuff with us. So they suck up to us big time, which is nice. And they made this slide, which is pretty cool. So they said, look, if you, if you take the broad universe of publicly traded software companies in the United States of America, and in the little note here, it talks about having more than $50 million of business a year. So not really small companies, but publicly traded software companies in the United States, you have about 250 companies out there. Okay, 250. If you'd say of those 250, show me those that have scale. In other words, those that do more than a billion dollars of sales every year. Your 250 drops down to 60 companies. So 60 companies do more than a billion dollars of sales every year in the publicly traded software space. Great. Of those 60, if you say, all right, that's great that they do a billion dollars in sales, but show me the ones that are seriously profitable, making more than a 40% profit margin. Okay, all of a sudden your 60 turns into 12 companies. Only 12 companies make more than a billion a year at more than a 40% profit margin. And of those 12, if you say, show me those that are growing at greater than 10% annually, you get down to three. There are only three companies out there, and that is Adobe, Microsoft, and Ansys. So we're in good company. It's uh, you know it's a it's a great place to be. We're really loved by Wall Street. We're loved by the investor community. Um, there's this entire world out there of people who know just enough about simulation to be excited about it, and we try to educate. It's part big part of my job is investor relations, getting the market to understand us better, our story, what it is we do, and that's kind of what I'll talk you through today. So who is Ansys? So we are the number one company in engineering simulation software in the world. Um, three things to know, like I said, clear leader, 50% larger than our nearest competitor. And that metric is done by annual sales. How much simulation software are you selling to the world? Simulation is our core business. That's all we do. Some of the other companies out there like Siemens, everybody's heard of Siemens, right? They're a massive company in Germany. They do a lot of simulation, a good company, good products. But obviously Siemens is a massive conglomerate that's doing lots of things and simulation is just a tiny piece of the portfolio. Not answers. We're a pure play simulation company. That's all we do. That's all we think about every day. And we have a worldwide presence. We've got over 5,000 employees, very well spread around the world. Something insane like, I mean, we have sales in every country pretty much, except the one we're not allowed to sell to. Um, you know, employees in something like 80 countries around the world. So it's fantastic. You know, great company, big company, worldwide presence. But we struggle because a lot of people never heard of us. There we go. That is not a problem in the world of people who make things, though. People who make things in general, they've heard of Ansys. 22 of the top 25 auto suppliers, 23 of the top 25 aerospace and defense OEMs, 10 of 10 industrial equipment, 7 of 10 oil and gas, 10 of 10 doing chip designers. You would be hard pressed to name a company of size that makes things that doesn't have some presence of Ansys in their portfolio. The other thing I would say to understand, and we'll get into more detail on this, though, is that certainly everybody in this room, all, all the uh, all the younger folks in this room, you've never driven in a car, you've never ridden on an airplane, you've never used an electronics device in your life that Ansys was not in some way important in creating. We uh, absolutely dominate the engine space. If it's got an engine, Ansys is critical to it. Um, everything electronics and signal integrity and flow, we are all over that. That's what we do. I uh, had a friend once note that the power of, you know, the really insightful comment, you know, he's an economics major, so, he, you know, and the technical stuff as well, he's a really insightful comment. He's holding a cell phone and he said, you know, they say that this has got as much compute power as these old supercomputers used to have 30 years ago. Said, yeah, absolutely, it does. So but they drew so much energy how is this thing not just exploding with heat? And I'm like, that's answers. We have a product that is exactly that. Power data management on chip. So things like that, you would need to think of all of them. So let's take a quick look at the portfolio. Again, that's kind of introduction to ANSYS, but what I'm going to talk about from here on out really applies to most simulation companies. ANSYS has a bit of a broader portfolio, which is one of our strengths. But 
it comes down to physics based simulation is at the core. You have structural mechanics, fluid dynamics, electronics, and electromagnetics. Those are really the big three. Of that, uh, of that one point, well, you know, we did, we, we announced T1. So of that, like almost $2 billion that we do of sales per year, the significant chunk of it is in these three structural fluids and electronics simulation. We have a broader portfolio that goes beyond. Semiconductor is also quite large. We do optical simulation, 3D design simulation, trying to inject simulation earlier in the design process, um, photonics. We have these system simulations tools, so tools to create and manage digital twins. So if you're using these tools to put together some fantastic simulation model, we've got a suite of products that will help you turn it into a more proper digital twin. And by the way, Dr. Wilcox proves a lot of favor around ANSYS because we have a definition, a very specific definition of what makes it a digital twin. <clears throat> and we get annoyed when people use the term digital twin wrong. And she runs around the world saying it right. So we all like that. <laughs> uh, so we have embedded software, safety analysis, um, you know, this kind of whole suite of systems. And we even have this thing called mission engineering, which is like, if you're going to, you know, execute some really large scale event, like an airplane flying overhead that has the same contact as a satellite, and also, you know, go land on a ship or something, we can do large scale what they call mission analysis as well. It's all simulation. But in this portfolio, what we really struggle with is this part right here, physics based. What's important for everybody to understand, and we spend a lot of time explaining to people who aren't familiar with ANSYS, and the simulation industry spends time explaining, is these are not video games, right? Everybody in this room should have a very keen appreciation for this. It's not video games. It's not made up. There's absolutely hardcore physics mathematics behind it. I sometimes get ahead of myself with investors, and I try to explain to them to really drive it home. I say, you go to any top university in the world, and you go to their mathematics or their physics department or their engineering department, you say, show me some of the most cutting edge research in applied mathematics and the futuristic stuff. That is the stuff that is feeding into our software. And I will talk in detail about that in a little bit. But to show them, this is what it's all about. It's about being real. It's not just made up images on a screen. There's heavy math behind it. Of that portfolio of products, we like everyone else, build it on top of a platform to allow people to make tools, customizations. We want everybody to be able to use simulation. Even when I joined ANSYS 11 years ago, not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, the only people that were really using simulation tools were analysts, what they call analysts in the industry. People that often have graduate degrees and really know how to use complicated software to do very special things. But simulation has promised way beyond that. One of my favorite pastimes is to think about what does our market look like in a hundred years? That's so far from now, right? Like, we'll all be dead. Like, what will it look like, though, in a hundred years? If you think about it, use it, all we really do is use mathematics and physics to predict what happens when something happens, cause and effect. That's going to be everywhere. That's going to be pervasive in ways that we can't imagine yet. And our goal at ANSYS is to stay on the forefront of that. And they would say the same at Siemens and the same at the SO and the same at all our competitors. Try to stay on the forefront of that and push this technology to really have the kind of impact to humanity that when you get, you know, nerdy moments thinking about what the future can look like, you realize simulation could be everywhere. It could be driving so many decisions. Um, so we try to build this customization tools to make it easier to everybody. And then of course, computing. Um, I walked by the tack room when I came in downstairs, looking great, really impressive, fantastic. Um, you know, we're trying to become location independent and unconstrained. One of the problems that I dealt with a lot in this building, in fact, it's coming, it's flooding back to me now. One of my biggest problems was bandwidth and just transferring data around. I would run a simulation somewhere, you know, off-site, and it would generate this massive amount of data, many, 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 many gigabytes that I would need to bring back down. That's a real pain. How would I deal with that? And so we're, you know, that's that's our problem. That's ANSYS's problem. That's the industry's problem. And we're working constantly on research methods to basically help alleviate that for customers in various ways. So that's what we mean, both patient independent and unconstrained computing. By the way, one of my, uh, my dad was a long time, and my dad is like, holds one of the records for the longest PhDs ever at University of Texas in the computer science department. And he had a great <laughs> saying um, that honestly, like still applies today. I mean, he's doing his degree back in the seventies, but he had this great saying, which was 
never underestimate the bandwidth of a pickup truck. In other words, you need all that data. Maybe drive up there, put the system in your pickup truck, and drive it back to where you are. There's your bandwidth right there. Not bad. Sometimes, you know, that's true. Okay, so let's talk about the industry and what simulation is used for. Simulation is critical to things like safety. Okay. Crash testing is an easy pickings. It's a, it's a very easy place to go to talk about what happens first, uh, to be your first example of simulation because crashing cars is super expensive. In fact, it's way more expensive than you would think. You might think, oh, for the automotive industry to do a crash test, well, let's see, when I buy a car, it costs whatever, $30,000. They get a deal on that. Probably they can build the car for $10,000, maybe some costs like $15,000 to do a crash test, right? That's absolutely wrong. It is incredibly expensive to do a crash test because you're not using a car that was made on a production line at volume. You're making it bespoke. It's extremely expensive and those crash tests can easily cost a million dollars. So hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to do a single crash test, simulation is the answer. If you go back to the nascent days of, of the automotive industry using simulation in the 80s, for example, um, the, the models are hilarious. They look chunky and, and ridiculous, but they were doing these little things to try to just squeeze out some advantage, but mostly they were doing tons and tons of physical crash tests. Whereas today for every physical crash test, it is preceded by literally tens of thousands of virtual simulations of that crash test. They get these things down so detailed and so accurate and so good that when they go actually do a crash test, they know exactly what's going to happen. They know exactly what it's going to look like. And as a result, they can do far fewer and save a lot of money and save a lot of lives. In fact, uh, our one of our um, marketing people, as a guy basically a head of marketing, was in a horrible, huge car crash, car crash two years ago. He's fine. He survived. But I mean, this was bad. If you saw the car, you'd be like, no way somebody could survive that. And you can only imagine, you know, the word that flowed out of him when he wrote this blog post after he was completely recovered, thanking the world of engineers, being like, my life was saved by stuff like this, because there's no way that he could have survived the crash that he was in, even just, you know, 10 years ago. Automotive technology wasn't there. And so this is the kind of thing that pushes forward. And it's not just understanding the crash test. If you really want to offer a full suite of simulation, you've got to be able to do things like, let's take a look at that passenger and model things like the spine. You've got somebody belted in here properly with a, with a chest belt and somebody who's not. And you can see, that's not good. Wear your chest, wear, wear your, your chest harness thing, right? <laughs> not good, that doesn't look very fun. So being able to, so, so they're all over this and that's just one little slide. Simulation is critical to process. Anything that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think requires simulation or, and by the way, I'm just showing like cool videos. It's not a lot of, you know, I just found some cool videos. And <laughs> but these are simulations of filling some bottles with different types of liquid. You got water and I don't know, the beer, who knows? And yeah, that one's ketchup, I remember. But um, you get used in process like this all the time. Pringles, you know, you wanna make Pringles on a production line? They're modeling those little thin chips flying through the air. You wanna fill tanks? You wanna be able to do it efficiently? All over. Okay, and that's a pretty good one too. Put a lot of effort into like the rendering behind that one to make it look super realistic. Critical to analysis, just kind of some outside the box at simulation applications that are pretty cool. Brushing teeth, right? There you go. Somebody's just brushing teeth, and then you can zoom in because it's a simulation. You can look and say, hey, show me the intensity. Where was this teeth brushed properly? Little things like that. And the reason that I show videos like this is to help people understand that. The market is incredibly broad. The use cases are stunning. I have seen things, I have seen customers doing simulations that blow your mind that, 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 that you wouldn't even expect or could, could simulation could be used for it's all over the place. And so while there's obvious applications like jet engines and structural integrity of automotives and everything, you get people doing toothbrush simulations all the time. We've had, we actually had a major chewing gum company try to simulate different material properties of chewing gum to see how easy it would be to scrape it off of plastic seats in stadiums. <laughs> I saw that analysis. I got them all lined up. It's hilarious, right? There you go. Um, critical to precision. So I said bread and butter right here, anything in an engine. So you've got a piston in an engine and little cam valves coming in. And if you go back to, I mean, automotive, uh, automobiles have been around forever, right? But if you knew the, you know, the efficiency that's driven in these engines today, internal combustion engines compared to in the past, it's because of tools like this. It's the ability to go in at a detailed level and simulate what's happening and fine tune it 
to a way that testing in a physical world would never really allow you to do properly. So overall, what this means is simulation is critical to business. Okay, we've got a bunch of quotes from a bunch of leading major companies out there basically saying simulation gives us the ability to take chances and do things. And, and the mission is eliminate physical testing. Every time that we see companies spending money on physical testing, that's a, a lost opportunity because you should be doing this in a computer. So like I said before, fine tune, fine tune, fine tune, do a physical test at the end to validate and you're done. And we've made an enormous amount of progress on that over the years and we're trying to keep going and going. So let's talk about the market. Simulation is an $8 billion industry. That's huge, okay? It's not some small little thing here. $8 billion of software is sold every year. And the most important thing is it's growing fast. It's the entire industry is basically growing at double digits, which is crazy, right? The economy grows at whatever rate, depending on how well we're doing, 3%, 4%, that would be great, sometimes 2%. Simulation is sitting there year after year, billions of dollars growing at a double digit rate, which is fantastic. Some of the quotes from market research analysis, the broader product lifecycle management market that, that simulation gets lumped into, they say the star of the PLM market is simulation. Um, there's little indication that simulation analysis growth is gonna cease. The sky's the limit. It's really a fantastic industry to get into. And that's why I say that decision to not go work for Raytheon, love you Raytheon, no disrespect, but to stick around, do a graduate degree here, get some real knowledge and expertise, and eventually wind up at ANSYS was a really good decision because this is a great market to be a part of. And it's really well spread, both by industry and region. So uh, I mentioned, you know, cars and airplanes and whatever you name it, aerospace and defense, 20%, automotive, 17 healthcare, high tech, consumer, industrial equipment, very good spread across and used around. Uh, the entire economy. Obviously, the big hitters are things like high tech and aerospace and automotive. Our job in life is to grow things like healthcare at 2% there. There's a lot of opportunity in healthcare for simulation of impact. So we're pushing hard on that. Many of our friends in the market and ourselves at ANSYS are investing heavily in that right now to figure out how can we grow that slice of the pie because there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff being made in there that simulation can help benefit. Um, you name it, the whole thing. Also, from a, from a global perspective, the market is everywhere. This is not a you know, North America phenomenon or Europe. It's everywhere. It's actually, I showed this graph because I love it. It's basically a third, a third, a third split amongst Americas, Europe, EMEA. Uh, excuse me, Americas, EMEA, and Asian states. And then finally, it is a healthy and competitive market. Like I said, I talk a lot about ANSYS because I happen to work there. But these are all the different players in the market. You've got ANSYS is number one. This is uh, last year's chart showing like 1.6 something. We were announced recently 1.866 billion, something like that last year. MathWorks with MATLAB comes in at number two. Kind of an interesting one. We personally at ANSYS don't consider Math, MATLAB and MathWorks a competitor necessarily, maybe a little bit in their Simulink department, but they're kind of friends of ours. It's a little different take, but then everybody else here sworn in, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> These are all the real competitors in the market. And of course, I joke, but you know, they all have great tools. They've all got you know great simulation tools that keep us on our toes, um, very difficult to compete with. <clears throat> Some of the brands and names out there. So uh, ANSYS in our structural mechanics line, we offer ANSYS Mechanical. We also offer LS Dyna, who a lot of people have heard of. In our fluid dynamics, computational fluid dynamics, we do Fluent, which is very popular, well known. Um, our electronics electromagnetics portfolio is Maxwell and HFSS. These are our brand names. So for Dassault, <clears throat> Dassault offers Abacus, which is a big competitor to Ansys Mechanical. Um, they also offer CD Adapco, Star, basically um, Star CCM Plus, which is their fluids tool. Um, sorry, that's in Siemens. Dassault offers Dassault offers Exa for fluids. Siemens has Star. Altair is a smaller company that's coming up. Hexagon has Nastran. Uh, there's a lot of flavors of Nastran, but they have the biggest flavor of Nastran and it's in Nastran. Um, and then on and on and on as you go down the list, there are competitors. But again, it's a very healthy competitive market. But then the question I always get from people, particularly at university, is can these results be trusted? And that's one of my favorite questions because we've got really good answers to that. See all these wonderful things, all these animations that show we're out there running around, companies all around the world are using simulation. 
uh, to a degree that would truly shock you if you knew the truth. But how do they know that the results can be trusted? So a couple of ways to talk about it. This is how we look at the world. So verification, which is the correct implementation of a conceptual model, of a mathematical model. Okay, we're really good at that. We can check that verification. We can do things like suite of models, the suites of models that are verified against known analytical solutions. We publish a big extensive verification manual, as does all of our competitors, to show you. Here's a simple, you know, here's a here's a simple analytical solution that our tool should give. And in every way you can imagine, every one of our different tools for almost every different type of major use case, we will have an analytical model out there published in the verification manual that you can yourself reproduce with our tool to show, hey, look, you get the right answer. Of course, everybody understands favorite saying around, all models are wrong, some are useful. That's really true. It's really important that you understand that. We try to drill that into our customers that this is an approximation. This is a numerical solution. We're not over in the mathematics department, you know, doing crazy things like solving for Ma's last theorem with beautiful proofs. We don't do that here. It's a numerical method. You're approximating partial differential equations for the most part and getting down to a useful solution that isn't completely accurate. Um, suites of models verified against known experimental data like industry sources. Um, NASA is great. They publish a lot of stuff. They're really open. So there's a good bit of that. And then also a lot of close collaborations with our top customers, people that we've been with for years that we work really closely with. We can't generally publish that data because they're sharing their secret stuff and saying, hey, Here's what we saw with our experiments when we did the physical test. Here's what we saw with your code when we did that test. And we collaborate on that and make sure that things are fine too. So that's our general approach to verification. Validation saying that the simulation accurately represents the system it's modeling. Well, that's largely up to the user, which as I say, goal, like yikes, okay. A lot of, a lot of burden on the user there, okay? Is that user, they, the, the reason I say it's got to be on the user is that we, we make general purpose software and we sell it to you. You can download and install it and you can simulate whatever the heck you want. Are you building a model that accurately represents the physical thing you're trying to simulate? Do you understand principles of meshing properly? Do you understand how to apply your boundary conditions, the difference between a you know, Neumann boundary condition or a mixed Robin type boundary? Do you know all that? Do you understand that? Because if not, validation might be off. Education is key. We work very hard on education of our user base, but the long-term approach to this is guides and guide rails. They are in constant and major development effort. The holy grail that we want to get to is a suite of software that has enough power and ability for the most advanced analysts to do whatever they want with it, but that at the same time can guide more novice users and keep them in line, but certainly not have as much power behind their fingertips but to get useful results in an easy manner. And getting that mix right is extremely difficult and something that we spend a lot of time on as well as all of our competitors, trying to make that, make, make that strike that balance just right. Regression testing. This is a huge part of our world of simulation software companies in general. Ensuring that whatever we do, new development, that our thousands of developers are typing code every single day and checking it in into the code base, Make sure that doesn't break something that's working. So we have hundreds of thousands of tests running constantly every single day, just advances to make sure, okay, these are what our previous version said the result would be on this type of model. Let's take all the new code and make sure it doesn't change to any significant degree. And if it does, we go, uh oh, no problem here. We also have these things called class three errors that the entire industry does. I think it's really interesting what a class three error is. If we ship out a version of our software that we later find has some kind of mathematical error that gives an incorrect result in a simulation that isn't obviously incorrect, we have to publish what's called a class three report, which is something that goes as an alert to all our customers. They say, hey, we accidentally put out a version that has this error. It calculated something wrong. We apologize. Here's a fix. It's not very common that we do class three reports, but there's more than one a year, maybe two, three a year that we have to put out. The good news is it's usually very limited in scope. It's a very specific thing and our software is doing something wrong, but that's pretty neat. That shows our customers that, hey, we're on it. We're constantly checking and finding things and looking to make sure that the mathematics are done appropriately and then we're not making some mistake behind the scenes. And then the last thing to know how the results are trusted <clears throat> is that we have a really strong feedback loop. 
It's constantly active. We have ISO quality certification processes. We have ISO auditors in all the time, checking all the processes I just described to see and make sure that we can get that stamp from ISO that says, yes, this has a quality process behind it that stands up. Any simulation software company worth its salt is going to have ISO 9001 certification. And that means basically that all this stuff is checked and audited by an independent party to make sure we're really doing what I just said with it. And we are, so it's okay. Customer facing engineering organization. Um, this is what we call at ANSYS our ACE organization, ANSYS Customer Excellence. It's basically the team of people that work with customers, whether it's in a, help them understand the code capacity, help them use the code, support them, do consulting for them. They are the secret sauce to any company like ours because they are the technical experts that are actually working with the customer. And we rely very heavily on them. And they're a big part of our development process to talk about what's going well, what's not going well, what's working, what's not, not so stay close to that. And then of course, forums and blogs, we monitor all of that stuff. Our development organization is filled with people who are super passionate about all this, as you can imagine. And if something happens or is said out in the forum, we find out about it. We know, because we're out there, we're, we're part of the community. And then of course, connection with academia is an important part as well. We have a lot of professors and research groups that use our code in an academic manner and are all over it. There's some kind of problem if they see something that doesn't work. Let me talk about that a little bit more. So we have a strong pipeline from academia to industry that really helps us um, make sure that we stay at the forefront of the market. So I wanna talk about a few of the ways. There are multiple channels that connect us in with academia, buildings like this, programs like this. There are some obvious ones like indirect, like open literature that's published. Absolutely, we read the open literature, we cite it in our documentation, we do those things go to conferences, we attend conferences, our developers are there, they're a big part of it. That's more obvious. Of course we do that stuff because we want to stay on the forefront and we want to understand that, you know, Dr. So-and-so just made a breakthrough in this area. And the reality is, is that it takes a long time generally for those breakthroughs to filter into commercial simulation codes, but they do get there. And I've been around 11 years at ANSYS and in the industry for almost 20 years now. And I've seen many examples of it. It takes a while, but it gets there. And it's really cool when that happens. The more direct methods are things like sponsored research. So sponsored research is a big deal. Um, ANSYS, for example, we want to bring the best available methods to market. We want to be on the forefront, like I've said. And the researchers out there in academia are generally eager to see their stuff used. So we pay them. And we get a collaboration and say, all right, we will pay you to develop this for us. And if it, aligns with our, if it aligns with our goals and it aligns with the goals of the research team, that's where the magic happens. And we say, all right, here you go. We'll fund your research and you know, we'll get rights to, to use whatever comes out of it in the code. Some active examples, these are very few. We have a lot of damage modeling research going on right now with various universities, phase field methods, Google Garage Multiplier method for context, which I think CMU, reduced order models all over the place. Everybody is in France, a lot of work in France on that. So all of these types of things are ongoing and we're paying money out into research groups to participate. And that's a really popular method for us to be in touch with academia. Consortiums as well, that's really helpful to bring industry and academia and software companies together. And then actually a big one too is employee relationships with advisors and peers in academia. That's very important. You know, everybody that works at ANSYS in a technical capacity is, you know, has a passion for Academia spent a lot of times graduate degrees, spent time here, knows their professor, knows their colleague. Strong ties are generally made again. And then there's also some direct academic pioneers out there that build bridges and kind of straddle the gaps. So there's a few, like Dave Sabone is a professor at Cambridge. Um, we bought his company uh, a few years ago for hundreds of millions of dollars. He started a company, we bought it, and he works for Francis now while also being a Cambridge professor, and that's fantastic. Um, Zoltan Sendez. Same deal, Carnegie Mellon guy started this company called Ansoft. We bought it for 800 million bucks. And you know, he worked for us for a while until he said, I'm too old and I'm too rich and I'm in charge. Chris Energy was uh, Dean of Engineering at Northwestern for a long time. He's now our CTO, Chief Technology Officer at ANSYS. And of course, Tom Hughes. So, you know, here at Texas, uh, when I was here in this building, Dr. Hughes and uh, his team were doing a lot of work in IGA, isogeometric analysis. And it's a great example of how long things take because that was in 2006, 7, you know, that 
it wasn't just starting then it had been around it was really getting seen it is now just the case dr hughes working with a small company that we know that we work with we're working on iga stuff it's kind of it's coming it's, there's there's early methods of iga type things in the ansys code now and it's going to be building and building over time because we're starting to get a little bit of commercial traction it's difficult though for it to turn that corner it's a really different world for saying to be robust and broad in a commercial sense versus you know applicable in academia and that's what i'm saying takes time but it does take there so i'm going to end with a call to action to y'all so the first thing is learn more about this important thriving market i've given you know the 50,000 foot huge overview of everything but what's wonderful about this is that each one of those different physics areas that i talk about you can dive in you can go as deep as you want and so everybody in this room has some passion something that they like something that they're interested in their topic of research and study and Go figure out what's out there in the commercial world and see what people are doing. You'll either find that there's something great going on and that's exciting and it'd be good for you to learn about it, or you find there's not much there yet. And that's greenfield opportunity, right? Who knows? Maybe we need to push into that area in various ways. And the other thing is consider joining one of the companies when you graduate. I, you know, I, I, I would not say I wasted time at the Department of Defense because it was a good experience, but I wasted time. I really, <laughs> I really wish that I had come to answers first. I did not know that there was a company out there doing commercial simulators. I simply didn't know much about it. And if I had heard of it, it was like, yeah, I don't really know much about what they're doing. So consider it. We need, uh, obviously, we need, you know, a strong pipeline of people going into academia and national labs and research institutes of various types. And there's no shortage of that out of programs like this. But we also need people coming into the commercial space. And it can provide a really lucrative and rewarding career. So consider all those things. Happy to take any questions. You all know me now. You can email me, talk to me whenever you want. I think that's, that's it. That's all I got. Yes. Uh, quick, quick question on uh, the comparison with other tech industries, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it seems very attractive to find special this kind of program. So. How does this compare, for example, in terms of pay and career growth? Yeah, great question. Any of the other big What you're asking about is a big part of my job. So I'm general manager at ANSYS, so I'm responsible for a book of business and all aspects of it. And finding good talent and people is a really difficult part of that right now because there are aspects of the tech world that pay a lot. They're very attractive packages, very good places to go. And so we rely on a couple of things. Um, I'll speak for ANSYS. It's generally similar for the other companies, though, in that we will probably not win the salary game right off the bat, right off the bat, okay? You can go get offers at Facebook and everything. Their salaries are higher than what we can offer. But we've got a couple of things that we lean on and tell people about that are really important. Number one is a very, very sturdy and stable market that is growing very consistently. Um, my dad worked for AMD for years, and AMD is not some crazy, you know, TikTok start fly by night weird thing, right? But it was so volatile. It was such a volatile experience. Looking back when I was, you know, when I was a kid and watching him work for AMD and how up and down they were as an industry and as a market and as a competitor in this thing, simulation is far more stable. Okay. We're not going to zoom ahead. The industry is just simply, we're tied to research and development budgets of the largest companies in the world. We're never going to zoom around. You're not going to see, you know, the industry experience 40% growth one year. It's not going to happen, but you are going to see every year solid incremental growth. Forward looking, I can't say for sure, but it's much more stable and compelling. And so that's attractive people. And also, what we, you know, what we do matters a heck of a lot more. I've had so many people leave that I've been that I've failed to convince to stay in our industry to come back and say it wasn't what I thought it was. It's way more impactful to work on something that actually matters than me something. So we rely on that. And then also, when you work for growing companies like this, we have all sorts of compensation mechanisms because money matters, obviously. At the end of the day, we have fantastic compensation mechanisms that reward good talent for sticking around. It's a difficult conversation to have when you've got, you know, Twitter out there offering a bigger salary right up front. But again, owing to the people who come back, you come work for, you know, a stable, sturdy growing industry like that, it's rewarding over time. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Can you expand a little bit on the opportunities growing, like healthcare industry, trying to 
model some kind of like drug delivery and, and like injection or via fat? How do you see that type of scenario? Yeah, like absolutely. That? So, uh, uh, Ansys and Ansys competitors that are the mainstays on the graph that I showed, all the big ones, we generally make simulation software that is sold to engineers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and engineers are great and they use our software and they get our software and that's fantastic. The healthcare industry, though, is driven by scientists. And it's a subtle but important distinction that, you know, the people buying and using the software are scientists versus engineers. Our whole industry is geared to engineers. And we're trying to shift to go towards making simulation tools that are more applicable mm -hmm. to scientists mm -hmm. and the way they think and the way they operate. And doing the things, like you said, drug discovery is a big part of it. There are drug discovery companies out there that do drug discovery simulations. And we get to know them and we work with them. And hey, you guys are pretty different because it's a different world. And so building that bridge is difficult because engineering physics simulation is a way bigger market than simulations of healthcare applications like drug discovery and things like that. Ours is a way bigger market. We've got a lot more scale and a lot more um, you know, inertia that we can apply in things. But we're working, I mean, I've worked very heavily right now on how to bring this heat, the, the teeth of those gears together and make it happen. So um, it's all out there. The technology is there. If anybody in this room works on healthcare stuff, which I'm sure they do. I did with Dr. Odin back in 2000 and 2006 or seven or something. We were, you know, modeling, um, you know, lasers on tumors and things like that. The technology is out there. It's the problem of converting it to the commercial industry and the way that we understand it at that scale. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rick. So when I started, in 1980, I used Dabacruz, Nastrin, and Ansys. Yep. None of those codes was more than 40 years old, and pretty much you needed to have a PhD to use them. Yep. Then there was a clear move towards, I will call those people draftsmen, right? People who were not engineers, they were designers who didn't know anything underneath. Right. Give or take 20 years. I want you to give me two timelines. One, when we will be able to simulate something like paste, which is of interest to the general consumer rather than to a technical person. Yep. Uh, and finally, when we will do simulation based advertisement and sales. Great questions. So, first, absolutely right about the draftsman, as you call it. So we so that's the CAD market, CAD tools, you know, SolidWorks. Anybody who went through an engineering undergraduate program used it. There are <laughs> roughly there are roughly ten times the number of CAD engineers, as they call them, and an engineer loosely sometimes. There's roughly <laughs> ten times the number of CAD practitioners than there are simulation users. So that's a huge opportunity for our industry, and we all salivate over that. And Ansys, along with every competitor, will talk your ear off about the fantastic simulation tools we have geared towards the CAD users. It's a big part of what we do because we want to tap into that 10X larger group. But it comes back to that problem I said, which is how you put guardrails around that. How do you make the simulation accurate and useful when you got somebody who doesn't really know much about engineering using it? It's not an impossible problem, but it's a very difficult problem. So we're working on that. As far as things like simulating taste, answers, we have to look directly to academia for that kind of thing. Because while we invest an enormous amount in research and development for simulation, to the tune of hundreds of probably four hundred million dollars last year was invested in research and development for simulation, we're not going to do that bleeding edge, way far out research. It's not. It's just not in our business model, right? So we look exactly like I described to academia, to groups that are saying, okay, what does it mean to simulate taste? Well, we got to, you know, that's a healthcare component. There's stuff on your tongue that I don't really understand. We've got to develop a mathematical model for it. I'm not aware if there's a mathematical model for taste, but I know one thing, we aren't going to come up with it. The university is going to come up with it. And when the university comes up with it and it starts showing results, it gets into that pipeline that I talked about. And we would love to come out and say, oh, wow, look, we can you know, simulate taste based on some you know, formulation of a food and how sweet is it going to be and compare and contrast. That would be huge. So we're all over that uh, you know, once it comes through academia. That makes sense. Uh, and what was the third one? Advertising. Advertising. Simulation-based advertising. Not come from that, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. That gets into what I was talking about, which is 100 years from now. What is simulation going to look like? And 100 years is provocative in a long time frame. But pick your time frame. There are so many things. In fact, 
I'll give you a heads up. We're going to do our investor day. I'm sure you're all going to be, you know, glued to your seats watching our investor day in a few weeks here. Um, and what we're going to talk about is how today you have hundreds of touch points with ANSYS. Hundreds of times per day, you're using something in some way. And that we want to make it thousands. We want to make it tens of thousands. We want simulation touching everything that it can because what is our value proposition? Our value proposition is simply predicting cause and effect in a general manner. And so where will that go? I don't know, but absolutely simulation-based advertising, who knows? There's a wide range of things out there that it could be, but we're on this incremental journey and we're, like I said, plot along and it's been very steady. ANSYS was founded 51 years ago, 52 years ago now. That's an incredible statement for a software company, right? 1970, and it has been a slow, steady march forward and it will continue to be so and where it leads, who knows? But again, I'm really excited because whereas you can look at a lot of other industries and you can see that that industry will eclipse, even major massive important industries like the automotive industry, it's gonna eclipse in some way in 250 years. I don't know, not math, not physics, not mathematical models, it's not going anywhere. That will always remain important. Yes. Yep, right there. Something No, sports is a sports is definitely an industry you know it's not um it's it's not like a major chunk of the pie chart but it's absolutely important and there's a lot of work done you're right to call it f1 f1 is neat because they recognize the importance of simulation and there's actually regulations that we monitor closely of how many compute cycles can you run simulating and they put a regulation on that so that one team doesn't get an unfair advantage by buying a bigger supercomputer um, so which is kind of cool, um, but there's sports applications all over. Uh, same investor day that I talked about. We talk about helmet impact. That's a big topic, right? So we did great simulation on helmet impact. Everybody does that. That's pretty common out there. Um, but you know, it's it's really just another good example of long term simulation will become easier to use, easier to understand and implement. And so those use cases that aren't as valuable, you know, developing. The, the stress model for a hockey stick that you're going to go sell to kids doing hockey in Canada, that's valuable, but not that valuable, right? How many hockey sticks do you sell in Canada? Probably a lot, but they're like 20 bucks each. It's not that valuable compared to an airplane that you sell for hundreds of millions of dollars and gets used. It's like, so as the barrier to entry for the simulation market becomes lower and lower, and we can inject simulation easier and easier into applications, you'll see applications like sports modeling grow and rise. And that's what we get excited about long term. Yeah. Yeah. So Dr. Ben was talking. Sorry. Anyway, Dr. Ben was talking about uh, simulating uh, advertisement and sales, and it occurs to me that companies like Facebook and Google and so on are doing simulations of those processes that just model free simulation, right? That are based on yeah, data. Yeah, that's right. I was wondering if Ansys has plans to do uh, model free type of problems like advertising and sales, or if Ansys is bread and butter is going to remain problems with primary models. Yeah, it's a good question. The way we think about it is we talk about it as basically physics domains and what physics domains we want to get into. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we don't have a monopoly on the word model. We don't have a monopoly on the word simulation. There's lots of things that qualify as models and simulations that we don't touch and we don't do. Um, what we do kind of have a monopoly on is, you know, physics-based simulation. And we talk to the extent that we try to grow our company organically or inorganically, which means through our own efforts or through acquiring other companies, which we do a good bit of. We talk a lot about what domains do we want to grow into. We're not about to jump into, you know, the type of things that you're talking about. We're not about to jump into that because there's plenty of fertile opportunity that's much closer to what we do. So we talk about, you know, one of the big discussions that we had over the last couple of years was optics. And saying, you know, we have this great portfolio. We don't do a lot of optical light simulation in our portfolio, but it's out there. And we decided to invest in it. And now it's like a hundred million dollar business for us because we put a lot of money into it and we invested it and it's super valuable. So we're gonna pick off the low hanging fruit first, but long-term who knows where it'll go. Yes. You mentioned that speed 
of development for the drivers that would continue to enhance it when the various roles that we set up and so forth are. What drives the speed of development of these papers in Ankara? Yeah, I think um, you know it's a commercial market with the demands of customers that drive it. It's not, uh, you know, like I said, the Department of Defense was a very slow pace. Um, and when you've got customers at all the biggest engineering and manufacturing companies in the world that need and rely on your product and they need it to do something it doesn't do today, and they've got deep pockets and they're paying you a lot of money, I mean, that drives incredible urgency through the entire organization. And for me personally, that's what I craved. I really wanted to be a part of that and know that the work that you know we're doing is being utilized now and it's having an immediate impact. And so it's just a personality type, you know. You do there's not there's there's as you guys are deciding, you know, kind of different career paths, you have to think about what your personality type is. There's not much more intellectual freedom that I know of than an academic who's good at fundraising. There's you can do anything. You can, if you're good at fundraising, you can convince anybody to let you go work on pretty much anything you want. You've got incredible intellectual freedom, but you run the risk that what you work on might be just a science project, right? That never gets used. And that's if you're cool with that, if that's what you want to do, academia is for you. When you come over to Ansys, I can tell you what you work on is going to get used and it's going to be impactful and it's going to really shape the world and, and change things, but you definitely give up some of that intellectual freedom, right? I don't want to make you think it's some sausage grinder. We actually do a really good job. We try to convince people and help them understand. It's not, you know, it's not like come in and work on this and this is all you got. There are a lot of developers that, you know, have freedom to pursue projects and do the types of things they want to do. But it's, again, it's not some academic who's good at fundraising themselves. They weren't anything. So it's, it's that kind of give and take that I think you got to understand and decide. Also, one other thing I want to mention, if you do go to a simulation company, another key decision that you have to make comes down to, do you want to be in the customer facing engineering world or in the development world? The technical people that come into our companies really fall into those two categories. And those are the big headcount, the big bucket. And you could do sales, but uh, sales, you know, it's not good. Sales is like, that's, that's for like the C students in engineering, right? <laughs> I, say that, I say that affectionately, being very close to many sales people who are here. Um, and they're fantastic. But it's the customer facing engineers who are using, I call it fielding the code. They're fielding the software out there, using it, helping customers understand it in various ways. That's really, you're an expert user of the tool. And that's super important and very technical and very valid versus being a developer, okay? Most developers, you're not gonna, a lot of, not gonna get a lot of face time with customers. If, hey, if you want it, I love it. I love to put customers mm -hmm. with developers. If, you know, I'm, I once had a developer tell a customer, why would you do it that way? That's incredibly stupid. And I was like, okay, you're not in front of customers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you gotta be careful about that. But, um, you know, you, you, if you're a developer, you're not usually customer time, you're, your back office working on the code and developing. That's a decision in either of us. 